thank you so much for that very lengthy <laughs> introduction. I sincerely appre appreciate that. Um, and, and for um, having the Just Jobs Network and IDRC and sp especially the Women Work and Gig Economy Consortium be part of this excellent event that Arthen is putting together on a very timely and important topic of the future of work. Um, so let me first just start by introducing Jillian Dowie, who is Senior Program Officer at the International Development Research Center, uh, which is, um, which is uh, b basically the uh, Canadian Parliament's Research Foundation um, that focuses on a wide range of development issues and funding research in the Global South. Um, and in particular, Jillian is heading a portfolio of projects that focus on women work in the gig economy. So Jillian, thank you so much for taking the time and we'd love for you to kind of welcome us all to, the, to this discussion and tell us a little bit more about the consortium and, and this particular initiative. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Sabina. Thank you and, and welcome everyone to this discussion on digital platforms, labor rights and organizing in the digital economy. Um, and thanks first to Stefan and of course Sabina and the rest of the team at the Just Jobs Network for putting this together and for Artha and to Arthan for creating the platform to have this discussion. So this year has been challenging for people in so many ways, as we know, and for many, including families, community organizations, unions, companies, governments, responding to the immediate and evolving issues that the pandemic has brought on has been really the main priority. But at the same time, we're hearing more and more, of course, now, especially on the need to build back better, to foster a more sustainable and inclusive economy, stemming from a really clear recognition that the level of inequality and insecurity for many, or maybe most people around the world is unsustainable. And the digital economy really needs to be considered in all of this. Of course, we saw a major demand rise for some aspects of it, delivery services for food and goods, of course, being the clearest example. But there were other areas where the impact was quite limiting, consider platforms for domestic services. The digital economy needs to be part of building back better. It isn't going anywhere. So we need to make sure we create decent jobs through platforms that regulations and protections, including social insurance schemes, extend to those workers and that the opportunities created are not reserved for the same kind of dominant groups in the offline economy. So starting from just about one year ago, I guess, the IDRC has been supporting the Women Work in the Gig Economy Initiative, which is looking to understand how platforms can enhance women's economic advancement and opportunities and build more inclusive labor markets with an emphasis on opportunities for low-income women and those most often found in the, the informal economy, I guess, in low and middle-income countries across Asia. And through a call for proposals, we ended up selecting six projects that cover seven countries and and will be or currently are collecting empirical evidence to help us understand the opportunities and challenges women face in benefiting from platforms to identify practices and solutions that platforms themselves may use to reduce barriers and to work directly with platforms, policymakers and workers to test scalable models uh, to create quality work in line with labor regulations in the digital economy for women. Some of the changes in platform work that we've seen in parts of Europe, for example, which are trying to get workers included in, in social protection schemes or to get them paid leave of different kinds, at least you know, sick leave, and to be recognized in some cases as, as actually employees of the platforms, comes from workers organizing and pushing this agenda. And without this kind of recognition, the work, at least some of the types of the work, um, resembles work in, in the more traditional informal economy anyway non-digital gig work, I guess we can say. And in the women work and the gig economy cohort, a few of the projects are looking at the role of technology in worker organizing, both within and in some cases outside gig economy jobs. Uh, but the use of technology is, is key to that. And they're also looking at different platform models that serve workers' needs and ensure that more of the benefits from platform work kind of go directly back to them. And this, this does include worker-led platforms or cooperative models, which may be viable in, in specific localities. And of course, central to this are questions related to gender. A lot of work being done through or mediated by platforms is male-dominated. So how are women faring in these changes? How, how are their efforts at organizing happening, especially in work that's typically more isolated, like domestic and care-related work? And how can the platforms themselves serve their needs better and be more inclusive? Uh, and how can labor organizing, and how has labor organizing been happening? How, and having an influence in low and middle income countries in this space more broadly. 
These questions are all important and hopefully the cohort of projects will be able to shed some light on all of this. Today, I'm really looking forward to a discussion with researchers and experts and with platforms about organizing in and for digital work, how this might play out or is playing out for women, especially in low-income contexts, and where we may go in research policy and practice to ensure worker voice and inclusion are part of developing new and changing types of platform mediated work. I'm going to stop here, but again, I want to thank the Just Jobs Network for, for organizing this, Sabina for moderating, Arthan for, for hosting as part of the Future of Work Forum, and our speakers, Payal Aurora, Janine Berg, Balaji, Krishnaswamy, and Gurpreet Singh for joining us today. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. Thanks very much. Back to you, Sabina. Great. Thank you so much, Jillian, for that. And of course, the IDRC for supporting not just the Just Jobs Network, both in its um, knowledge management role, but also in its research and all of the other fantastic institutions that are part of this research cons uh, consortium. Uh, so let's move to the next part of the program now that we've had Jillian kind of give us an overview of what this, the kinds of questions that this research ad addresses. Um, and the kinds of challenges and opportunities that this new emerging digital ecosystem of work is posing for women. Um, you know, I think those that are privileged are often blind to the privilege that they enjoy. And so I think the real key question here is, you know, as technology is driving this new ecosystem of digital work, how can we make sure that it's going to be a place where women can participate compete and thrive. We know, as Jillian has already pointed out, that there's enormous inequities between men and women already in this new um, evolving digital ecosystem of work. 300 million fewer women use mobile internet compared to men. 20% um, fewer women um, own smartphones relative to men. We know that, that uh, there's um, several uh, parts of the gig economy, for example, transportation that are male dominated. And as Jillian, I'm just picking up on, on, a, on some of the key points that you made that, you know, a lot of the types of work that women are engaged in, whether it's microtasking or whether it's care work, um, it tends to be uh, more isolated and could potentially uh, keep more women in private spaces as opposed to empowering them to go out into public ones. And so to further break down this new emerging ecosystem, it is a real privilege um, for me to, uh, to actually introduce uh, Janine Berg, who has been an enormous support and guide for me throughout my career and, and someone who is um, not just a very, um, excellent senior economist, but also a person who I really respect. And I'm really happy to have you here, Janine, to, to bring insights and, and thoughtful, nuanced um, insights into this conversation on women in the gig economy. And to kind of break it down for us and just and, and set the context with, with some data um, to, to kind of give us an overview. And then we'll turn to the rest of our esteemed speakers. So with that, Janine, thank you so much for being here and over to you. Thank you so much, Sabina. It's really great to be with you virtually. I wish I could be there in person. I hope to someday soon. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me for you, by you and also your other colleagues at the Just Jobs Network. It's really great to be here. So yes, what I thought to do today was to actually present um, a little bit of data and basically some work that we have done at the ILO on the topic of online digital labor platforms and women's engagement in these platforms and what are some of the issues that have come about from it. So I'm gonna give a, a short presentation. I'm not covering the local platforms. Um, we have done some work in that area, but I think maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. I wanted to present instead the, kind of the online work also because so many of us are working online right now and there's such huge consequences for that. So let me start. Can you see my screen? I think you are. Yes. Okay. Yes. So 
So many of us are working from home, but we have to remember that before the COVID-19 pandemic, many workers were already working from home. 11.5% uh, of women around the world were working from home and 5.6% of men. So it was very much, uh, even though there's still a lot of men who, are, who were working from home and are working from home, it is a very highly gendered mode of production. And of course, this is a reflection of the unequal burden that women uh, uh, you know, have um, with respect to care work. So if they, where they work at home is a way to combine um, their care responsibilities and still earn some sort of income. We, in 2015 and 2017, my colleagues and I at the ILO started studying crowd working platforms. Uh, we wanted to find out a little bit more about the working conditions. We had heard about them, but there wasn't really very much uh, information on the topic. So we launched a survey that we put up as a task on five uh, prominent uh, English speaking micro task platforms. And so what it revealed to us was that there were workers all over the world. So this was English language platforms and we found workers in 75 countries. Uh, there are of course platforms in, in all languages, uh, the Russian level, the Russian speaking platforms are very prominent, French, Spanish, uh, other languages as well. So this is really a widespread phenomena and it has really important gender implications. When we did this survey, what we found was that in North America, there was pretty much a gender balance of, of uh, women and men working at home on the platforms, but this wasn't the the case in the global south. In the global south, the percentage of women, as you can see from this chart, was much lower than the percentage of men. Uh, so in Asian Pacific, for example, there were 20% 20 20 of the respondents to our survey, which there were 3,500 uh, respondents to our survey, were, um, were women compared to 80% of men. So now I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about women's engagement in these platforms. So there were fewer women in the global south, but when the women were engaged, the, the reasons for why they were engaged were very different. And this is especially true in the North American platform, um, in the, amongst the North American workers, uh, where we actually had some sort of gender balance. So this is an analysis of um, the caring responsibilities of men, which is the orange bar in comparison with the women, the blue bar. So as you can see that the, the percentage of, of women on the platform that have children is much much higher, and the percent of them who indicate that they have caring responsibilities is also much higher, much more than double uh, that reported by men. When then we ask them about why they crowd work, um, most more, more women than men said they did it because they, it meant that they would be able to work from home. A lot of them saying that either they can't, uh, they can't leave their house or it's not worth it for them to leave their house because with the cost of childcare and their care responsibilities, it just didn't make, it didn't make sense for them to do it financially. So they needed a job where they could work at home. Men, on the other hand, tended to engage in this work as a way to complement their income. So you can see the, the orange bar for the men is much higher than that for the women. There are also in the US, in this model, um, in this data set of US workers, we also see that the, the women reported a, a larger percentage of poorer health. When we did the analysis of earnings on the platform, we were very surprised to learn that actually uh, women were earning less. And this was true really at the lower end of the distribution. Um, at the higher end, those who were more successful crowd workers, men and women earned about the same. But for the ones who were, let's say, less successful, their earnings were less. Um, and we attributed this really to a high, the, what we found was that a lot of the women who were doing this work, because they were combining it with care responsibilities, were being interrupted constantly and didn't have kind of the quiet work environment that they needed to be successful on the platforms. And you have to recall here that these are actually uh, microtask platforms where the worker is not identifiable. So this is not discrimination on the part of the employer that is causing this wage difference. It is basically just a reflection of the unequal distribution of care responsibilities at the home. 
Okay, we also did another study on Ukraine. So Ukraine is a, a country kind of like India where there's really a, a really strong IT sector, um, a strong on, online presence. Uh, when we did the analysis of platform work in the Ukraine, we calculated that about 3% of the labor force was engaged in online work in Ukraine. And what that revealed to us too was really strong gender segregation of activities. Essentially, what we found was that the men, the, the activity, the online activities were reflecting what was happening offline. So many more men were in IT, uh, whereas many more women were in translation and editing, copywriting, that sort of work, uh, to teaching and tutoring. So kind of more, more female types of work, uh, whereas the men were more in these kind of the IT and the higher skilled sectors higher skilled, at least the way they're valued uh, by society. So what this meant then was that the ability to work on different platforms was affected by the skills that they had. So when we looked at the earnings, what we found was that the earnings of men were much higher uh, than, than those of women. So if we look at the medium earnings, this is in the Ukrainian currency, it was more than double uh, that what we found for the women. Uh, and so the, actually the gap was higher than what we were seeing in the offline uh, labor market. But this was because the, the men were able to work on freelancing platforms that were international platforms where they had clients in North America or in Europe, whereas the women, because of their specializations, tended to be working more on Russian-speaking platforms or Ukrainian platforms, which didn't pay as well. Uh, so if you see here, the Ukraine, post-Soviet countries, other countries, is how much earnings are on those on those specific platforms. Uh, and so this is what really accounted for this big uh, gender wage gap between men and women in, in Ukraine working online. Um, some of the new trends that we're also seeing, um, you know, online work has really taken off, especially with the pandemic, but even before that, there was a lot of movement in that direction. So I think, you know, what most people say is that the pandemic is an accelerator, and I think that that is very true. We're seeing a rise in what's called virtual assistants. So rather than hiring a, an administrative assistant locally, people are hiring an administrative assistant uh, through a platform uh, located in another part of the world. The problem with this, I mean, in, in theory, it doesn't have to be a problem, but the problem that we have from it is that the workers um, who are mainly women doing this work of virtual assistance are being classified as independent contractors. Um, so they're not privy to the protections and benefits that they would have in a traditional employment relationship. So they have what we think in this in this situation would be what is called you know, disguised employment relationships. Because the platforms are set up so that the workers are available for set hours. Uh, so they either work part-time four hours a day or full-time eight hours a day with set breaks. Uh, and they're also required to download a time tracking management system that takes random screenshots and is used to record attendance. This is also something that we see commonly in the freelancing platforms. So this means that they have the monitoring and control of a traditional employment relationship, but they don't have the tit-for-tat benefits that you would have uh, in an employment relationship. Okay, and then just to um, one other slide, this is from a study that was done using re real time data uh, after the pandemic hit, looking at uh, when people shifted to working from home for their employers, uh, how many hours per day were spent um, doing care activities uh, or helping children um, in, in the US, UK and Germany. So this is comparing basically uh, men and women who shifted to working from home. And you can see in all three countries, there's a big gender difference about who's spending more hours on childcare and who's spending more hours on homeschooling. And, it, and it's women who are doing that. And of course, this has real important consequences uh, in the, for them at the world of work. So it, it leads me to two basically main conclusions from all of this. Uh, so the first one is really online jobs can be great. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with shifting from offline to online. But right now, they're set up in a way, um, especially the ones that are going through these platforms, they're set up so that the workers are 
classified as independent contractors. And so they don't have protections in minimum wages, um, in working time, in, in leave, in social protection, all of these benefits that come with an employment relationship. And, and in many instances, depending on what they're doing, sometimes their earnings are okay if they're kind of more higher skilled freelancing, but a lot of the micro task work is not, play, not paying very well. And in many instances, actually less than the minimum wage, even though the workers are actually be quite uh, highly qualified. So the first thing really is about how do we address the precarity in online jobs? And of course, this is much trickier to do because of the global or planetary nature of this work. Uh, you know, if you have the employer in one country, the platform in another country, and the worker in another country, it's much harder to regulate um, working conditions. And then the other issue is that you know, gender equality begins at the home. And, and we, we can't forget this. And this, I think what we, sh what we found in our, in our studies was that this, this is critical. So you can bring the work home, but the second you bring it home, things are going to change, just like they change when women go out to work. And so you, we still need really the policies uh, that are important to address it, you know, policies such as paternity leave uh, or public provision of child care or public provision of elder care. These policies are still really fundamental for having greater equality at the home and then, of course, greater, which allows then greater equality at the workplace. And then finally, the last one, skills is definitely an important issue. I mean, you can see that with, you know, the, the the, the, the fact that the men have higher IT skills and could earn more is a good thing, but it's not enough. I mean, we can't just be all chasing after the, the highest skill sets. We do also have to address, um, you know, the very important work that, that women do, even outside of the online sphere, the important care work, the essential work that they do, and how to have that work be compensated in our societies in a way uh, that um, remunerates women fairly. Okay. Thank you. That's for that's all for my presentation. Great. Thank you so much um, for for that presentation, Janine. I think what is really interesting is, of course, this comparison between online and offline work, and that not only does online work now reflect some of the same inequities that we've been seeing in the offline uh, work, but that in some in some forms of online work, it's even worse. Um, and so then the question becomes, as you just said, how do we address this kind of precarity and, and regulate this new emerging uh, ecosystem of digital work that in some ways is moving at a pace and scale that um, institutions today and regulatory institutions and government institutions are not necessarily able to keep up with. Um, and so I think to kind of uh, drill down deeper, I'd like to now bring in um, some of our additional panelists. And I'm really excited today to have Fayel Aurora, who is the, uh, a professor at Erasmus University and also author of The Next Billion Users, Digital Life Beyond the West. So Fayel, thanks so much for joining us today. And you're an extremely uh, prolific um, expert in, in this area. And so it's really a pleasure to have you and, and to get to be able to solicit your views on uh, many of the issues that Janine's presentation just raised. Um, so in some ways, I think this, the emergence of this digital ecosystem of work is seen by some to offer great potential for increasing women's labor force participation and, and employment. Because some people believe that this is the ex exactly the kind of thing that women need to be able to balance income generation with domestic responsibilities. And I'm curious about whether this is how you see it. Um, what opportunities does platform work provide for women and what are the challenges that they confront in entering platform work, in sustaining it, and in, in leveraging it for economic and social empowerment. If you could sort of just pick up where Janine kind of, you know, uh, pick up off of the points that Janine has just laid out and, and offer your views would be very grateful. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you, Sabina. And it's uh, really a pleasure to be with all of you here. Um, you know, a lot of familiar names and people I've been meaning to have a conversation with. So this is fantastic. Um, so yes, actually, Janine really set a good foundation for this as she brings up. I think the key point is 
that we should not forget the site of domesticity as a way in which we can really comprehend the challenges as well as opportunities that are before us, right? So to put things concretely, uh, so Usha Raman and I are uh, basically founded a, a lab called FemLab, which is, you know, seeded by IDRC. And we've been looking at low income women workers and how they collectivize and use themselves, their skill sets and organize themselves to capitalize on these new opportunities, including digital tools, which are meant to carve the pathways for more employment opportunities. But uh, already through our stakeholder analysis, what we're finding out is a couple of things. So for example, we've been talking to platform workers and they have been very vocal in emphasizing that we've got to start looking at it as uh, a woman, like a women as sellers or as individuals separate from their family, their household. Because if we really want change, we need to look at it as a household unit. So, for example, when they go online, they're working with their brothers, their husbands, their, you know, uh, their father. It's basically a family unit trying to operate. And indeed, it's very much like the resonant of this first wave of feminism where the woman has to do it all, right? The domestic care work, care work domestic duties and bring in income. And that is obviously not a sustainable and obviously a very archaic model of women's empowerment. However, what is interesting to notice is it starts off that way, but incrementally, as say the husbands start to notice the women actually bringing in money and coordinating all these, they start to take on more responsibilities. Also subtly, maybe a little more care work, a little more domestic work, and the changes are happening incrementally, but it is important to look at how we can address them as a unit. So that is one insight that was given by the platform workers, but it reminds us that, you know, in many ways we take, uh, an, as we make an assumption that uh, digital empowerment and e-commerce can actually really be empowering, but there's a double-edged sword to it because basically what we are looking at is women are relegated to the domestic sphere because being a, a woman at work is not considered very honorable, actually. So when women actually uh, engage in public doing work, it can be dishonorable because they're interacting with strangers. And that kind of uh, cultural trope is very still very powerful. So them being relegated to their domestic sphere surely can empower them in terms of getting more money for the household and gaining respect internally, but it still doesn't challenge the larger rubric of them working with strangers to make a living, which itself requires change, right? And I'll leave it at that right now. Great. Thank you so much for, for that and, and those insights. And um, I think we're all also waiting for the additional results of, of the research that you are conducting as part of, of this consortium that IDRC is funding. I have additional questions for you, Pyle, but I think what I'd like to do at this stage is to, is to actually bring in um, uh, some of the platforms. And we're really excited today to actually have um, two members from platforms here with us and so let me start with uh, Gurpreet. Um, Gurpreet, if I could actually have you. Am I, Thanks. Am I... You appeared and then you disappeared, but now you're back. So uh, Gurpreet Singh is actually co-founder and, and chief revenue officer of Awigna. And so first, Gurpreet, let me just start by kind of asking you to just tell us what Awigna is and your business model. And then I'm going to ask you questions that also then recall some of the um, the very important points that, that Pyle and, and Janine both raised. Um, so I just want this to be more of a conversation. So let's just take a minute and find out about your, your company. Thanks, thanks, Sabina. First of all, uh, big thanks to you, Sabina, and Just Jobs for inviting me, and also Artin Group to organize this, I think, very important panel. And I proudly represent the platform uh, part of this world. So, so I hope I'm able to give the valuable insights and also uh, get to learn from you guys, right? So within the field-based work, they will prefer a white collar oriented task, say an audit, say a sales role, or say uh, an invigilation, 
to you know as compared to a last mile delivery or a verification work right now there are a couple of factors that play here uh, one is of course they will prefer more work to travel right they will prefer to visit a known entity uh, a restaurant or or let's say a retail outlet rather than an individual's house and of course they prefer skill based uh, work rather than uh, the the gray collar or blue collar a uh, kind of work requirements now apart from the field you know requirements we also take up digital online requirements that is a large preference for any women gig partner in fact uh, from all the people that work in digital gigs 70% of them are women so they will take up content operations tele calling online proctoring and many such work from home tasks of course because it gives them the right flexibility it gives them the right uh, kind of safety and and also the ease of doing the work from home so so i think that that's the kind of trend that we've seen uh, sabin in the past four years mm-hmm. with working with both male and a female uh, you know gig partners mm-hmm. so well, I, i think thank you for that gopri i think what, you know it's really important to understand that some of the choices in the kinds of jobs and tasks that women are taking on um mm-hmm. some of the choices that they're making are really dictated by uh the disproportionate burden of homework or other factors like safety for example um and and so you know and 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 maybe access to to skills training um and so in that sense these these choices that women are they are making really choices file um i wanted to kind of throw it back to you for just a second and kind of talk a, you know get get your views on that i mean how does one through your research and the extensive work that you've done how does one kind of make this issue of choice a, a real choice as opposed to this kind of artificial one where you know um these platforms like awigna that are actually providing very important employment and income generation opportunities to women and are also allowing them and enabling them i should say to have greater flexibility but on the social side these aren't real choices that women are are making right so in some ways the market once a, once again is getting ahead of us um how do we kind of you know how do we kind of reconfigure the incentives in the system to cre- create a more even playing field. Bile it's all on you now. <laughs> yeah, it's a humble small question, right? So, um, you know, I've been really struggling. I think my, we all have been struggling to see this complicatedness because, you know, on one hand we see some very disturbing trends of A, a decline in participation, particularly among low-income uh, women workers. So, of course, when you look at gender, we need to unpack about, you know, higher income. There's caste. There's all these intersectionality elements which create very different, uh, even opposing narratives, right? So, we could actually take one part of data as Gurpreet uh, brought up and say, well, look at the benefits that women are achieving, but this happens to be probably middle class, educated, maybe a little more upper class, caste, right? So you have a different segment whereas we are focusing on low income workers and in terms of legitimate choice, legitimate consent, this is something which is very challenging because it starts up with what are my actual real choices in terms of the kinds of work do I, uh, that I can do which and what is it contingent on is it based on my family approval which is very important often the in-laws because when you get married now actually as a sign of progress for example in india having a, a, a like being a working woman is an asset but actually it's not empowering on the surface it may appear empowering but actually it's the conventional well she has to do it all right so she has to take on care work domestic work and actually employment work which actually she may want to not do including even digital tools to embrace digital tools takes tremendous amounts of energy to navigate through the hate speech and you know reputation management which is a constant struggle we see so it may actually be more empowering to disengage from the online world which as we see as a particular trend going on right now so the 
problem is that we have these cultural, the, the solution is not a technological solution to a technological problem. It's a cultural social reform. And that's going to take a while, right? And it requires collectivities, civic organizations, and we do have that. But what we can see is that we can look at uh, how the emphasis is also on men, young boys, and also involving them in this kind of gendered work. Because it's not a woman's problem. It is basically a societal problem, right? That we want us to move uh, together. So there's choices, not just for women, but we have to also emphasize the other side. Choices for men to be who they can be. They don't have to take on their father's business, for example. They don't have to be the bread earners only, right? So if you start to step back and say, okay, this is as a unit that we're trying to move forward and let them actually be as flexible as they can be based on their uh, leanings, based on their aspirations, based on the opportunities without actually the constraints of cultural tropes that actually are deeply gendered and cultural. So. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely one of the big challenges. But uh, in terms of platforms and choices, I think it's not just platforms. What is, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more, but it's the intermediaries that have come about. There's this, you know, in the onset of the internet, people thought at last the gatekeepers are going to dissipate and soon it's going to be just me as an entrepreneur and the platform and the rest of the middle middlemen are going to dissipate. And for decades, these middlemen have been extracting a lot of the value and consistently keeping prices low and you know exploiting workers in a consistent level over decades and so there's been a lot of hope but what has happened is that there's been a shift of the nature of intermediaries in fact one can argue there are even more intermediaries to navigate in these new worlds of e-commerce so yeah so these are the so those need to have choices. And in the end, regardless of that, we need to have a larger safety net. So as to allow people to exercise their flexibility, their movements, you know, without killing the goose, shall we say. And so some conversations about the universal basic income is circulating right now. I mean, COVID has basically pushed us to start rethinking in a significant way what kind of society we want to live in, right? At least we, we, we hope that that's the case, right? I know. Um, I mean, the, <laughs> the problem is that we might, you know, you and I and the, and the insightful people that are on speaking on these panels at Arthens Future of Work Forum and those that are just might be thinking about these issues, but there's a larger world that may just go back to business as usual. We, the reality is that we, we just don't at this point. We're, we're hoping that this is some kind of a wake up call that leads us to reconfigure um, the way that we live and work and to create more equitable and sustainable societies. But we're, we're just not sure at this point, but we certainly hope. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I'm not deliberately not going to pick up on the issue of universal basic income, because I think that that could be a whole debate session on its own. Um, but what I do think that both you and Janine raised um, a very fundamental point, which, you know, Janine said, um, to just paraphrase, gender equity begins at home. And, and in some ways, I think you also talk about social and cultural uh, norms that need to be changed offline in order to create a world of work online that has more equitable opportunities as well as outcome. Um, what I'd like to actually do is at this point, I would like to bring in our second platform, um, uh, Amazon India. And I'm really excited here to have uh, Balaji Krishnaswamy with us, who has graciously agreed to, to, to uh, speak with us. And, you know, um, so Balaji, great to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time. You know, Amazon is a, is a huge company with, uh, with many functions and initiatives. And your partners range from self-employed contractors that work as delivery personnel to your small shops initiative focused on bringing small businesses online. I'd love to understand in this vast universe that is Amazon, 
Um, how do women engage with different opportunities on your platform? And I, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot and say in India and internationally, if you could kind of give us um, um, some insights into women's engagement with the range of um, you know, services that, uh, and products that Amazon offers. Uh, thank you, Sabina, for having me on this panel. And that's quite an interesting question, especially since most of the points that I'm going to speak one way or other has been covered. But before I answer what you asked, I want to tell a couple of opening statements, remarks. Number one, whatever the mankind, you please note the word mankind, and policies could do for women and getting them onboarded to have an equal opportunity, pandemic has done more than that. The last eight months has brought tremendous shift just because of the diverse value that women bring to the workforce. So that's one thing that we are noticing. I'll just come to that later. later. The other significant is the gig economy is no longer something which is out of this world or something which is, uh, let's say, a differentiator. You know, I would like to take a month, a year back when TikTok was a rage. The number of users or the number of people who were there on TikTok, you would find women outnumbered the male folk. There are not many instances where women were able to pick up a new platform, absorb, adopt, and adapt for a better livelihood purpose or just for entertainment rather than the male folk who are more stereotypical and wanted to do the same thing, same way, multiple number of times. So those are the two things that keeps coming back at us when we are at Amazon and looking at how do we ensure that we keep moving ahead and we have an onerous task, as Payal mentioned, the intermediaries. The beauty of e-commerce is to ensure that the last person on the ecosystem gets as much opportunity as a person who's an MNC or who's a big one. So is e-commerce able to do it? Yeah, I would still say yes. How much of a women folk play a role in that? Large. Somewhere in Feb earlier this year, there was a number of 163 or 165 million entrepreneurs were female, right? If you look at the last million entrepreneurs who got onboarded globally, a huge percentage would be female because they were able to pick up the opportunities from pandemic. They were able to get off the block faster than the male folk. A man was more looking from a stereotypical way of, oh, should I do this? What if I do it? I need to be the breadwinner. How do I ensure that I earn still? Am, is my job safer? Whereas a woman was able to use a multiple skill set and say, okay, fine. I was a communicator till Feb 2020. I quit my job because I didn't want to do work from home in, with the extended corporate hours. I have a skill as a baker. So I'm going to start my own bakery and then dovetail anything else that I can do. So she was on to e-commerce platform, able to earn her living and was able to do what she was doing and a lot better than a man who was still stuck trying to say, look, I need, I have a job, I need to keep my job. So that brought a focus to our programs like Saheli, Karigar, which are all women-centric programs. When I say women-centric, I would want to call it as an gender equal centric, but those programs are women centric because they are one who absorb faster. They are able to make a better product and sell it faster, hence they are women centric program. Sorry, can you tell us just in one sentence what those two are? Yeah, Please. I just come into that. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Saheli program is a way to onboard a female seller. Right? She could be an entrepreneur who is this SMB, has a plat wants a platform to sell something. Whereas Karigar is a tribal art, art-centric program. Both of them are women-centric, so they are different streams. So when I want to list myself showing that, oh, I'm going to sell XYZ furniture or other kind of inventories, then I get into a Saheli program wherein 
Amazon onboards you to a Sahili program where a customer knows when they go to a Sahili program, it's a female run thing. So it's the end seller is a female. Whereas Karigar is a tribal oriented, tribal art oriented program where there could be a seller, could be a male or a female. And both where it is listed very carefully what kind of products you have and what is the end impact. So when I say end impact is when you go to a career program and say, I, I'm going to sell 100 scarves. I list the units which I want to go across and sell. Whereas when I get into Sahili program, I just say, look, I am going to be on board. I'm not going to list the number of units that I want to put it across. I will scale up gradually. So both the programs, the entrepreneur is handheld by Amazon to make a choice which market she, wants, she or he wants to sell, where there is a scope for them to expand their business. And if there is a need for them to connect with a financial, let's say they want to pick up a loan. So then they are given a certificate which says that they are a Saheli program person with Amazon. So they go to a bank and apply for a loan. So that's the Saheli program, wherein a female seller lists what kind of product she wants to sell. As I mentioned, Karigar is more of an art. Anything which has an weaving, bed sheets, linen. So all those kind of hand woven stuff fall into the Karigar program. And as I mentioned previously, last 1 million was a global number. If I look last 10,000 number of entrepreneurs who onboarded onto Amazon, my bet would be there would be a huge number coming from female, not from male. So, so that's the show. It, it, Have you... Um... How do you know that these sellers are actually female? Is it self-declared? Is it, how, how do we actually know that? And also, have you by any chance done any analysis of earning differences between men and women entrepreneurs? Um, yeah. So, uh, no, we have not done any research to find out whether male, female, so it's just numbers for us so we don't but when you onboard a seller so you take them through multiple steps so which is where they need to speak to the person and get them onboarded sign a lot of documents and take them through how the program can work so that's where you get to know you are actually speaking to a friend or it is actually a female seller who's not trying to take some advantage so that's how the onboarding process is where you actually meet the seller okay and, uh, and, and also what kinds of um, sort of algorithms guide the onboarding of these new sellers? And, you know, do you, for example, have suggested price lists for their items or, you know, what, what kinds of sort of, what does onboarding mean in yeah. this respect? So uh, see onboarding means when a seller comes to us and says, look, I manufacture shampoos. Right. So we then say, okay, there are 10 different kind of shampoos that's available in the market. It's organic, it's herbal, it's chemical oriented, blah, blah, blah. And then say what, which category they fall into. We say that, look, if you're looking to sell herbal shampoos, it has a great market in, let's say, European countries. So you should not just list your product within India. You should pick up our European program where there is a better chance for you to sell your product. Price is something that we don't suggest them because it's a marketplace. They choose this price. The beauty of marketplace is they choose the most competitive price. Once the intermediaries are removed, they want to make... So the, the game of e-commerce is in volume, not in absolute numbers. So that's why we don't get into price. They keep looking at the tab that they have. So they know that they have listed a shampoo. They can search within shampoo and see what other same product, same category shampoos are offering their price or competitive different kind of shampoos are being offered. And then they decide this could be a great price. Unfortunately or fortunately for us, we don't get into price because that invites more of a policy trouble than anyone would like. Sure. No, th thank you so much, Balaji, for those questions. And I'm, go I'm going to come back to you. But at this point, I wanted to sort of, you know, pivot the discussion slightly to looking into 
this issue of protections and social protections. So we know in India, for example, this whole issue of um, the recent labor codes that have just been passed and the um, and the rules have just been released. So uh, it, it just very quickly, Balaji, uh, before then uh, I switch to Gurpreet again to get his views, I, I would love to ask you what your views are in terms of, you know, um, the provision of benefits to these self-employed contractors or entrepreneurs that are either providing services through Amazon as an intermediary or, you know, uh, using Amazon as an e-commerce site to sell their goods. How, how should they be protected? Does Amazon do any kind of offer any kinds of benefits as such or um, and just kind of more broadly what are your views on the best ways to ensure that these workers have basic protections um, you know in order to be healthy competitive um. you know uh, maybe you don't need a protection right now you need something which is more of an enabling act for them See, look at it uh, with internet being so predominant, it's no longer a nine to six job. Because let's say that there is a time difference between US and the Indian time, there is a difference between UK and India. So all of a sudden you are not working with a specific timeline. Hence, whatever the usual norms were within offline. So which means that I knew I need to get up at 7 a.m get ready, go to office, no longer exist. It depends on the market that I'm going to service. Hence, your timelines are varied. And then it's also within the gig economy, it's fast moving. As long as you're updated, you, are, you need to keep yourself updating on various aspects of technology, which keeps you a better employable. And that's what defines growth for you. So, which means as long as there is an enablement policy, which says that, okay, if a resource is there, there is this three-step process for the resource to enable, empower, and move to the next step over the next five years. So, those kind of things would be necessary because you just can't say, okay, I have got to ensure that there's only eight hours of job, especially with people who are with entrepreneurship mode. Try telling... If I try telling you, Sabina, just work for six hours a day, you are done. It's not going to work, right? So it's the same way that they need to look at various opportunities, work according to multiple geographical timelines. And while you set this process of saying, okay, you are on a contract which defines your set income. So the wage, minimum wage is defined. Thereafter, it's a top up that you decide what you want for yourself, what is the goal that you are looking from yourself, and then you go across and achieve it. So that's the kind of a model which gig economy is going to define. I know multiple sellers or the sellers they employ, right? So uh, Wav Shampoo, right? This is one of the shampoo maker from Himachal. They are among the top four sellers in the US. Right? They compete with the biggies there. Um, their entire supply chain has a good ratio of female worker versus male. And because everything is defined by a timeline and shipment, everything, they let their R&D team, which is more or less female oriented, and there are no timelines set. So I don't know how their production will work. I think more of an enablement is the need of the hour. Great. Balaji, thank you so much. I, it's really refreshing to have someone like yourself who's willing to really have a candid conversation about issues that can sometimes be sensitive. So I, I really do appreciate your being here and, and your willingness to talk to us about these issues. Um, Gurpreet, I wanted to bring you in quickly and just uh, run by you a, a, a similar question, which is, you know, given that workers on your platform are self-employed contractors um, or entrepreneurs, as we just heard from Balaji, you know, on the on, on Amazon, you know, in essence, they are legally responsible for their own security, right? Yeah. 
What do you think about this? And what kinds of worker protections does OIGNA provide? Hmm. And Janine and Pyle, I'm coming right back to you. Thanks, Savina. So uh, I think, Savina, this is a question, as you rightly pointed, a sensitive one, and people may shy away, shy away from this. But I think I would want to share a couple of uh, my sense here. See, for a long time, gig workers have not gotten the due recognition uh, by the government. And in fact, last year, we did not even have a word in, in our legal uh, documents. And now, uh, I strongly believe that it will be a combination of the industry as well as the government coming together to put together uh, a marriage between financial inclusion and some social reforms, which will eventually nurture this whole ecosystem, right? So that's one. Second, I'm the happiest today that government has actually initiated a dialogue here where we are talking about gig, we are talking about platform workers and they are being given the recognition. Now, I believe that any reform whatsoever will actually make this system much advanced and eventually lead to people sticking to gig platforms. It will benefit everyone, not just me or not just the gig platform. It's a win-win for all. So that's the other thing. But as a platform, see, I believe that we cannot keep waiting for these reforms because they will take time. They will take their own uh, 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 own sort of discussions. What we can do is provide certain enablers, uh, as you know, uh, Balaji rightly mentioned. Can we do our bit to to make sure that the ecosystem develops around the gig economy? So, a couple of things that we do as a platform, uh, we so especially for women, we try to create city-based WhatsApp groups, right? It's like a small community group which help them gel with each other and also know that there are more, more women in the same uh, boat and, and they can you know take guidance, take help. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we also give them some travel allowance, which is a special allowance, which is uh, trying to um, get them to evade the mobility uh, related issues that they might have while you know working on the ground. And as a you know gig kind of a system, we are also trying to uh, enable our partners with some kind of easy credit. So we are partnering with other platforms to enable this. We are helping them opening their bank accounts if they see, okay, you know, I am not sure where will I take my money. So we guide them there. Uh, we also try to, so we are partnering with a couple of uh, medical platforms to provide consultations at subsidized rates. This is something that we thought we'll do after COVID. I mean, when the pandemic started. So I think these are small things which will create that environment. Uh, and as Pyle rightly pointed out, it cannot be just technology solving technology. It has to be the 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 peripherals which will uh, give the right cushion. So that's that's my opinion, Sabina. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Gurpreet. Janine and Pyle, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation. Janine, first over to you. So we've had, you know, these two representatives from uh, platform companies that have really been very candid with us and I think have, have posed to us basically this question about, um, you know, this idea that uh, th this distinction between enablement and protection and what is the need of the hour. In some ways, the discussion on social protection has always also been inclusive of the active labor market policies. Um, and so in some sense, it's not that much different. And, and maybe it's, it's uh, active labor market policies plus, right? Plus all of these other issues that both Janine and Pyle have raised. But I wanted to just pause and kind of turn to you, Janine, first for, for your reaction about this enablement and you know, and, and protection on the other hand. What are your thoughts about that? Okay, um, so one of the things that we haven't talked about too much, I mean, a little bit, it was uh, hinted at with these WhatsApp groups is the whole topic of voice. Yes. And so I think here there, you know, with all of these discussions and I'm, I'm happy, I'm not, um, I'm not very aware of what's going on in, in India right now with the discussions on the platform economy and, and, and gig workers. Um, but I'm very happy to hear that there is a discussion. But what's really important is not just, I mean, it's important to have the platform's voice in these discussions, but it's also really important to have the worker's voice. And the more that there can be really a, a dialogue among the workers and discussions, collective discussions of the workers with the platforms themselves and with the government, that's going to help matters incredibly. Certainly these 
I mean, the, there's some really wonderful aspects of, of, of working on platforms and selling, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you can sell through an e-commerce platform, the, you know, this does definitely platforms, we need to make sure that, you know, there is actually a normal curve here, a normal distribution as far as the earnings. And the only way we're going to have some sort of close to a normal distribution and some equality with the earnings is if we have some um, and these policies have to be wide ranging. It can't be, you know, this is, there's always the kind of the famous discussion in, 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 in policy making, you can't have one policy to solve all the problems, you need multiple policies. And we've talked and touched upon a lot of really different issues um, with the platformer economy and gender issues. So, you know, you have to have the, the, the policies that are going to address the home, but you really do need to have some sort of policies that can ensure that the work that's being done on these platforms um, is what at the, at the ILO to, we refer to as decent work. Social protection policies are, are a basic that everybody needs. Um, we need some sort of minimum floors that everybody can have access to. Now, whether this should be you know, a non-contributory system that's coming uh, you know, financed through general revenues or whether it should be also a contributory system is a, is a discussion that the country needs to have. But it's clear that people need access to you know, medical services and, and you know, some sort of... Um, income protections during really difficult times. And I think, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has made it clear how we need this minimum kind of levels of social protection. Um, so I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of throwing a lot out here, but I just want to leave it as, you know, it's, I think the really important thing is to have this dialogue, to really, to have workers um, be able to convey to authorities and to platforms in a safe may, way where there's no reprisal, their concerns, um, to see, you know, to really enter in these discussions and see, you know, what policies could we be developing as a society to address some of these concerns? Because if this is, you know, the future of work, we want to make sure that um, it's going to be a future that benefits as much of society as possible. Thank you, Janine. And, and, and just one more quick question for you. I mean, as senior economists at the ILO and the ILO has really been championing this whole discussion around a social protection floor. I, I wanna kind of take that and say, how is the multilateral system and, and, and how, is, how should global governance evolve? Um, what should be, if I were to say to you, what should be the top two things that need to happen at that level in order to make this social protection floor a, a reality? or to actually establish some kind of global governance guidelines up for the platform economy and social protection of the platform economy? What would be the two things that need to happen? Um, if you need a minute, I can go to Pyla and come back because <laughs> I know I'm throwing that question at you and it's a huge question. So why don't we do that? Why don't I, I, I wanna okay. come back to you with this question. Um, but let me go to Pyle first and also get her views on kind of the social protection issues that we just talked about, the distinction between um, sort of enabling um, assistance and social protection and kind of how, what are your views, Pyle? And then Janine, I'm coming back to you with the global governance question before we once again open it to um, additional questions from the from the audience. So let's just go first at the national level and then we'll zoom out to the global level. So Pyle, over to you. Yeah, I'm busy fighting sun right here, which is very rare in the Netherlands. So this is a freak day. <laughs> so anyway, all right, but going climate back to the change, topic. Right? Climate change. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I think Janine uh, touches on some key uh, points and one of the fundamental points she brought up about is decent work. I think that's something like I'd like to put in the notion of quality in work and how that impacts participation, you know, and also defies of peripheral logics of because it's such an oversupply, surely people will do anything, right? I mean, because the fact is that, of course, there's an oversupply of low uh, income laborers and multiple global supply chains have been built on the fact that they can just do what they want to do because if it's not one they can literally move countries forget moving uh, between workers so yet what do we see right now is we see there's some serious 
uh, issues going on, whether it's with cotton uh, farmers, we read about the headlines in today, where there's actually there's no work, people are not coming to work. Uh, we see it in uh, Latin America, where uh, for coffee planters, they are not even, uh, in spite of being paid three times more than the average rate, low income workers are refusing to work on these plantations. So, and you know, that actually highlights something is how fundamental it is to get decent work and how we need to re-evaluate the larger global supply chain into because what they're doing is they're not moving any, they're not budging the institutional structures across it and yet they want to reform this tiny little segment which is about oh should we enable this small segment without in reassessing what constitutes as enablement on the overall global supply chain so just to give you a much more concrete example uh, of what femla uh, has been working on in uh, a case in point is Bangladesh and uh, the Jamdani handloom uh, industry. Now, it is one of the deep prides and it actually is uh, considered a cultural heritage uh, endorsed by, uh, you know, UNESCO. And uh, so it's got all the makings of surely this is people are willing to pay, pay big bucks for a very women intensive artisanal sector, which is this handloom business. And yet it is facing extinction, except because of the COVID, a lot of them have gone online, the sale of it. And there has been a shift in actually, we notice an uptake in people actually making uh, money out of this because some of the middlemen have gone, but it, it goes, like this is a big question mark and we are go delving into it next year deeper so we see a little shift in trend because of that but the fact remains is that you know these women have been spending extraordinary hours and in deep precarious uh you know conditions and are producing these gorgeous materials which literally signify the cultural heritage but don't want their children to have that future so you are facing, you're, you're not only are you going to have a loss of uh, a profession, you're having a loss of culture, and you're going to have a loss of an entire industry if e-commerce is not looked upon in a very fundamental way. Because my fear is that the intermediaries are going to go in there because it's easier for a woman entrepreneur to go to a marketplace and sell her jamdani sari, and maybe even circumvent an intermediary. But when, with the e-commerce, my guess is that it's the intermediaries who are coming online, capitalizing on this uh, lack of supply, right, for now. But long term, would women actually become even less active in the sector? That's a question uh, which is worth asking. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a problem is that we are not, you know, I've been asked uh, in recent, uh, in the last few weeks, actually, by a number of different global industries, because I, uh, I do a lot of work on next billion user markets. So I've had investment firms, uh, global seed companies, really a random solar panel companies, a complete random set of companies. And they're all trying to carve their path of the next billion users, which are low income workers around the world. But they tell me, please, when you give a talk, do not shame companies. OK, can you just like give us best case scenarios? And I, I get it. We need to come up with this, this common grounds. Right. And touching back on what Janine said also is about, uh, you know, enablement structures. Yes, you do need some thoughtful policies. You need some thoughtful measures and a global level because these global supply chains are not just national. Right. But it's also in terms of the dehumanization takes place in the governance of the data structures, right? Because we notice that they can actually go to the lowest common denominator, dehumanizing processes by simply like you see, we've already done some basic work on Uber drivers and Ola drivers where they have barely any time left before they accept the next ride. And this algorithm keeps getting shaped uh, you know, uh, at a accelerated pace where it actually creates high burnouts. And this is happening in factories in terms of the calculating based on how efficient you can actually work in a short amount of time to be hyper productive. So dignified work also needs to look at these data structures just as much as policy reform, labor reform, and it requires a much more ecosystem approach to this um, issue. 
Kyle, you raise several very, very important points. And I, you know, I just going back to sort of um, going back to look forward, um, how, you know, at, at how COVID is going to impact the world of work. One very important point, your Bangladesh example, uh, sort of A picks up on what Balaji was saying about, you know, um, more entrepreneurs, female entrepreneurs kind of leveraging online marketplaces in order to generate income during this period. We don't know if they're doing it because it's, a, you know, an exciting new opportunity or to what extent it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't like the word desperation, but to the to the extent that they're being compelled, you know, to, to what extent is it a compulsion? Because that is all that is offer, on offer at the moment. And I think two points about entry into platform and, and digital work are, are worth taking note of. One is the fact that in a post-COVID world, the longer social distancing lasts, the longer that people get used to kind of working from home or working remotely, that is likely to push up the kind of uh, demand for, for the kinds of services that people get at home, right? So case in point would be beautician services. Maybe women don't feel as comfortable going to salons anymore. And so now we're getting women, you know, particularly in India, we know Urban Company and others that provide these services at home. And so, um, you know, uh, food delivery or, things like Amazon kitchens, for example, right? Where women aren't necessarily doing the delivery of the food, but they might be preparing the food. So in some ways, I think in a post COVID world, we're likely to see this uptick in the kinds of opportunities um, for women, whether again, it's, it's um, artisanal products that are being then brought into e-commerce e marketplaces for women to sell. Um, we're likely to see a demand and somewhat of an uptick there. The second point is that the internet has very low barriers to entry, right? It's essentially a, you're a self-employed contractor, come on board. <laughs> you know, you're an entrepreneur, come on board. And so when you have such low barriers to entry, inevitably you have an influx of workers as other jobs are going down. Aviation, hospitality, uh, physical retail, all of that is, is uh, you know, in India, up to 35% of small businesses are now, have already failed by some estimates. When we look at these numbers and the lack of jobs in other sectors and the decline in other sectors, and we see relatively low barriers to entry in a digital ecosystem of work, there will inevitably be an influx of labor into this sector that then further depresses wages and working conditions. And so the question again before us is yes, we need enabling, but, but if there is an influx of workers in this digital ecosystem, we can enable more to get on, but we also need the protections to make sure that there's uh, a, a level uh, playing field for everybody. And at the end of the day, I think the important thing is that when workers, when people have jobs that pay well and harness their productive potential, businesses do well. Because at the, at the end of the day, it is about aggregate demand. If people don't have the money, they're not spending it, they're not gonna go online and shop. So, so it is a, you know, we need to create kind of a, a virtuous circle that both enables and protects um, and I think voice is very fundamental to that. So my next round, we have a few more minutes. My next round, I'm going to come back to the issue of voice. Um, but before I do, um, I'd like to throw it back to Balaji, who I think wanted to come back in, Pyle, and, and respond to some of the, the points that you raised. So Balaji, um, please, with, with, with that long sort of intervention on my part, I, I, I would like to bring you back in to respond to Pyle and, and, and Janine as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, there, Sabine. Uh, Pyle, more from an Amazon perspective and the query that you have or the worry that you have on the intermediaries perspective. You know what, uh, as part of onboarding process, let's assume there is a female entrepreneur. So she has an Amazon person who handholds her. So whenever there is a product which is ready, she now keeps the product at a warehouse 
of Amazon, and then Amazon does the shipping, everything once the orders start coming up. Or she can keep the her own place as a warehouse. Amazon person will come and pick it up and take it. So there is no intermediary for her to reach out. So which is more of a simpler, easier way. And that's where in India, there is a more challenge because the intermediaries are threatened. The resellers are threatened because right now, if I as a seller decide to go on Amazon marketplace and sell it, so there is nothing a reseller can do because you as a consumer, when you go across and see, you will see two listings for the same product. One at a lower price because the seller doesn't have an intermediary, lower overhead cost and a reseller because he's bought the product from the manufacturer or an SMB but has to add on his own overheads and there are two different costs. The only advantage with a reseller could be he could do a faster delivery because he could be closer to a geography. So that's something where an intermediary gets pushed out. So that's the efficiency model. Is it 100% happening? Not as of now, but I'm sure with more and more adoption, it will happen. So that's how the there's a lot of challenge that we face as a marketplace because so many intermediaries make the same noise. It's their livelihood, which is on chopping block as of now. Thank you, Balaji. Pile, yeah. did you want to jump in quickly? Yeah, I just had, a, Balaji, I had a question for you. It's like, so the, with the Bangladesh context, a lot of these, uh, especially with this Jamdani example, they've gone to Facebook because Facebook has become the e-commerce platform out there, which means that it is not designed specifically and not guided. What you're bringing up is commendable but it's a very small sliver of what is represented in the e-commerce for the segment where basically it's sort of a wild wild west they're getting on facebook it's partly and whatsapp facebook messenger there's multiple platforms they're managing it from networks they built over maybe a decade going you know at the marketplace their customers have got on it they notify them through a whatsapp group uh they take the risks about payment options so there's there's a lot of carving of how do you market and you see numerous Facebook pages come up. So it's a complete um, you know, wilderness, at least in Bangladesh, in the way in which e-commerce is playing out in the segment. Uh, because the barriers of entry, even though very low, as you explained, at least seemingly for Amazon, is still lower for Facebook because Facebook is far more intuitive for the population that we look at, which is often low income, you know, users who believe Facebook is the internet, right? So I'm curious if you see, you know, you see that challenge and how Amazon fits itself against Facebook in this regard. See, uh, an easier way to look at it, Facebook is predominantly looked up as a platform for social interaction, not so much for social buying. So when I want to, when I go to Amazon platform, I go there to buy a product, not just to serve. So if you look at today in India, Facebook has launched their own small shops initiative because they see a lot of traction within those pages. So they also are trying to create something which is for small shops, get yourself registered as a small business person and do business. So as long as there are clusters formed, you know, there are a lot of state governments in India which have taken the initiative and formed clusters for sellers to come on board to a marketplace. So we work with, let's say, Ministry of Textiles to form a cluster and come on board to marketplace. So there is a, in this case, the government acts, government body acts as an intermediary, brings this cluster of textile manufacturers onto the platform. As long as they're able to come on to a platform, and are able to market themselves. It's all on the marketing aspect that makes a difference. It's not so much of a wild west when you pick up an Amazon or a Flipkart or a Snapdeal because that's where you actually list yourself as a seller and you, you reduce the risk of payment. Because once you are listed, so when I go to Amazon, which means I need to buy. So when I say payment option done, so they are sure that their payment is done. Whereas when they go to Facebook and then do the transaction, then the returns become a problem. 
and they lose their credibility faster which is where when you operate through any of these platforms you have reviews rating of the sellers which gives the consumer the comfort consumer is much more easier happier buying through an amazon flipkart because he knows if the product is defective he gets the money back or the product new product whereas if you do through a facebook page you don't have either of the options so all these smaller facebook pages will go merge into facebook small shop options or they will come into larger platforms and there are sellers who are very smart when i say smart i mean it in a congratulatory way they build their own websites right while they list it on facebook they will also list it on their own website so they do the marketing at both places and when you go to their website or to facebook listing they direct there are multiple more products which are there on their own website so making a cluster creating their own identity and a brand is way these sellers will move are already moving that's what the next 2 3 years are going to be all about i hope it's not going to be a wild wild west there thank you balaji now i'm i'm just looking at the time and so i would really like to give a uh, the almost the last word to Janine. So Janine, coming back to you, um, we also received an audience question asking about, uh, from Nitish Nath Srivastava asking about, you know, are there any ILO backed laws or conventions for the gig economy, um, particular, particularly looking at women workers and taking into consideration uh, more equitable wages? Um, and how can we encourage more women to work in the gig economy. So let's just go to that broader governance question and, and come back to you and look at, you know, what you sort of would suggest in terms of global governance, multilateral governance that could improve outcomes in terms of social protection and strengthening voice, which is extremely important. Right. Okay. Um... So I'm going to move a little bit back from the e-commerce discussion and, and focus a little bit more on, on, on kind of the workers and workers' protection. So for people who are working on local-based platforms, regulating that is much more straightforward at the national level because the people are actually doing the work in that jurisdiction. And so they would be covered if, you know, if the courts uh, or the legislature deem that these workers really are employees or some other status that they want to give to these workers, they could then, you know, develop some sort of protections for these workers or extend protections for these workers and ensure that they are you know, complied with and that these workers are protected. So the local platforms, even though it's been a, it's been a struggle, it's, it's much more straightforward, at least from a legal perspective. Uh, and here, you know, voice is really ha is critical. And in fact, a lot of what we've, a lot of the, the response from governments that we've seen across the world is because there have been so many collective efforts among drivers or delivery workers, uh, you know, protests, um, other sorts of efforts that they've done to have their 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 concerns raised. What's tricky uh, is that the world has become, you know, not all of it, but part of it, a planetary labor market. And so, you know, um, Payal was talking about global supply chains, which have existed for a long time. But there, even with at least the the distribution of different parts of production, the supply chain it would, you know, at least be done, you know, in a in, in one specific country with an employer. So. There was always the, the problem of holding the lead firms accountable, but at least you had the employer in, you know, in the in the country that where the workers were, you know, be it India or or whatever country that you know we're talking about. Now with the online labor markets, with the, you know the 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 data that I was sharing with you and the studies that we've done, it's really much more tricky because you have platforms, clients, workers located all over the world. And so, you know, having a law in one country doesn't do much good because there could be conflict of law interests with the platform saying, no, actually it's the law in this jurisdiction that apply. And, and the workers saying, no, it's the law in this jurisdiction. And there could be um, kind of court battles over this problem, um, which would be very difficult to solve. So it, it makes us think a little bit about, well, maybe we need, you know, maybe the time has come. The, the world has become global. It's, you know, the, the ILO is 100 years old and 
and the whole system of international labor standards were conceived really for kind of national labor markets. Uh, so maybe it's time to be rethinking that. So last year uh, was actually the hundredth, uh, the centenary of the ILO. And for that, the director general of the ILO established a global commission on the future of work. Um, and this was a kind of an independent commission that was headed by the president of South Africa and the prime minister of Sweden that had you know, 23 experts from, from business, from academia, from, from trade unions, kind of the, the world of work to, to be represented at this um, in this commission. And one of the things that they discussed was the platform economy and these kind of online, you know, international cross-border platforms. And so they recommended at least some sort of global governance that could deal with some issues, some issues such as, uh, you know, ensuring payment. You have problems of people doing work, submitting work, not getting paid. They try to contact the platform. They get an algorithmic response. There's no human that they can talk to. You know, a lot of this is algorithmic management and it's a real source of frustration for workers. Uh, telling them to have collective voice, well, that's all, all peachy, but when you're located all across the world, it, you know, it doesn't work very well. So there is a need from some sort of kind of global mechanism. So one issue is that they could at least deal with these issues of non-payment, um, but they could also deal with issues of social protection. You know, to what extent, okay, you know, maybe we can't be regulating this like we would in a traditional employment relationship, but maybe some sort of systems could be developed um, where platforms contribute part of um, earnings or profits to social security funds in specific countries proportional to the percentage of workers that are on the platforms. I mean, none of this has really been hashed out about how to go about doing this, but there is at least, there was a recognition by this global commission that we need some global responses to these challenges. Um, and just for the e-commerce, I think, you know, that's another area that also needs some global discussion. I mean, there are conversations at the WTO on the e-commerce rules um, and those are, are quite heated, but you know, who, how, you know, should there be ceilings on commissions that are charged or on fees that are charged to the entrepreneurs on these platforms or, or the workers on the, you know, depending on how the platform is configured, all of this does require some sort of regulation because there is an asymmetry in power in these, in the platform economy. Um, the people who run the platforms have all of the information, uh, the work don't have it. The, the, the little trade unions that are involved don't have it. Um, so there is really a, a case to being made of, you know, how can we find mechanisms to kind of minimize this asymmetry? And one of, and just, I need, I know we need to finish, but just one thing to add is one of the things that's, that's actually um, good about the platforms is that there's a lot of data. The platforms have it, but the data is out there. So when the time comes that there is going to be some sort of regulation, um, the data would be available to, you know, to ensure that, you know, uh, Social Security payments are proportional to earnings or that there is a minimum wage instituted or, or whatever or commissions aren't too high, whatever it is that, um, that, that the authorities decide to regulate. Thank you so much, Janine. Kyle, I'm going to turn to you for two minutes because there's two questions that uh, that I, I think you could kind of take together. So uh, one question is uh, from Mukta Nayak from CPR, who asks whether there are good examples where companies have been involved centrally in policy conversations around gendered impact, dignified work for the most vulnerable segments in labor and, and uh, women and then other um, vulnerable segments in labor and also women that are uh, even more vulnerable because of what be it cast or, or other factors as well. Um, and, and also a question from Craig who also asks about, um, you know, are there uh, ways that we can um, are there ways that we can sort of inspire or incentivize companies to provide social safety nets in the gig economy? So we heard from Janine about, you know, the multilateral system, about global governance and about the ILO's initiative um, and the sort of um, problems associated with kind of trying to, uh, trying to govern this, what is essentially a cross-border international flow of information and services at the national level. So, so those are all points very well taken. But I'm going to look to you to kind of go a little bit deeper in two minutes on what, what companies can do. Um, and then, you know, and then we'll, we'll end the session. But um, over to you, Pyle, two minutes. 
All right, got it. <laughs> so, um, well, firstly is that the notion of dignified work is not a frozen entity, right? It is dictated, what constitutes as dignity is dictated by the people who work within these jobs. And that's gonna be a shifting, evolving concept as we progress over time. So the collectivization, even though indeed has become far more challenging, digital media technologies do actually allow for collectivities uh, at a global level, as you've seen with the massive protest movements from the Me Too to Occupy, to, we have a legacy of protest movements, right? Uh, so I do have a lot of faith. And in fact, our project is grounded in the idea that indeed these are new forms of challenges and the platform economy and the gig economy is structurally individualized. On the other hand, these digital media technologies are deeply communicative uh, technologies which allow for collectivities and global empathy across borders, which can fuel change and, and pressure across the global supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very important thing. And in terms of inspirational models, there are indeed, uh, like for example, a case in Bangladesh, Regulations coming from a country level are probably going to be very weak because they know that if they make it much difficult, much more difficult, then these uh, brands will move to Cambodia or Vietnam, right? So to expect a country to do the best they can do for their uh, citizens is sort of, you know, uh, obfuscating the responsibility of the brands themselves. And what we have seen is a few brands have come up with. Uh, a sort of a coalition where they've come up with a higher set of standards and what they expect from their intermediaries, uh, which are above what the Bangladesh standards uh, propose. And it's not because they're altruistic, but because, like I said, it is a lot of workers are choosing not to be working in the lowest uh, of the uh, ladder of the global supply chain, even though they need the work, even though they're desperate, because they just cannot they do not find this in a dignified manner. And there's a lot of pride, which we actually do not give them that credit for. And another good model, and just to wrap that because of time constraints, is say co uh, cooperatives, for example, allowing workers to have some kind of shares, like Huawei, all the scandals, uh, you know, around Huawei, et cetera. And obvious case, the one interesting element about Huawei is that they, the CEO allowed the workers to have shares in that company, which enabled it to be one small time fry to a massive global entity. And we have the Amul collectives in India, for example, where which allow for cooperative investment. So, I mean, these are little examples of if you have workers involved and invested in your company, it could shift and address these bigger issues we are facing right now on this tremendous and growing global inequality, which seems to, you know, promises to grow uh, unless something dr dramatic and, you know, the re-altering of the redistribution of benefits gets to be thought out in these very structural ways. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. And well, thank you. I, I think it's really interesting that uh, Janine was sort of um, sort of uh, talking about the multiple challenges that we would face in collectivizing workers across borders. And Bile is talking about the, op the potential opportunity yeah. of technology in providing a means of collectivizing what would otherwise be disaggregated workers spread out across the world. So, you know, I think this is wonderful for a just jobs, um, you know, um, Bile having you involved, ILO, uh, Janine, have all of us come, sort of coming our head together, putting our heads together. and maybe writing something specifically on this kind of um, tension that there might be um, in, in, in voice um, in the gig economy. And I know, Pyle, that's your bread and butter, but just bringing in <laughs> and, and availing your expertise and kind of bringing in um, these multiple perspectives, I think could be a really interesting exercise. So I have been given a, a green light not to, you know, to keep it sharp, but but not feel too stressed about time. So very quickly, uh, Gurpreet, is Avigna a good example of um, a, a company that provides benefits and, and, and does 
and does or will potentially do more than just enable uh, its workforce, its gig workforce? I'm putting you on the spot here. Pick you and Sabina. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think as as I you know pointed out the 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 last time also, I I am a strong believer of the fact that if we do not do this. Uh, the gig partners will not trust us with with all their uh, you know all their money that they have to earn all the livelihood that they are depending upon us so so as a platform we do have to take certain bold calls uh, to basically uh, you know give them the right contribution in terms of their saving schemes the provident funds uh, their uh, let's say health insurances and as a platform if we do our part i'm sure with the help of the government coming in um i mean the the system the 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 gig partners will be able to much appreciate uh this whole flexibility in the job that you know as a platform we bring in and as a whole uh, both of us will benefit so uh yes today we are enablers yes we are getting the right access to credit to you know as i said medical services or insurance platforms uh, but eventually i think it would be the, the the platform and the government to come together uh, to form uh, this uh, this collaborative uh, kind of a, a initiative to help them in proper social protection laws but at the same time we have to keep a balance uh, in the fact that gig economy persists because there is some amount of flexibility gig economy persists because there is some amount of low barrier to starting something so the compliance has to be a little less but the protection has to be a little more so i think that balance is something that we would have to ensure when the public policies are being made great uh, and on that note um i just want to take a moment to thank again jillian dowie the C senior program officer at the international development research center janine berg uh, senior economist at the international labor organization balaji krishna swami you know from public policy communications with amazon india Gurpreet, of course, uh, co-founder and chief revenue officer of Awigna. Uh, Payal Arora, a professor of Erasmus University and author of The Next Leaders, The Life Beyond the West. And with that, also a great thank you to Arthur um, and, uh, and, and my colleagues, um, Stefan Bailabed and Gregory Randolph and other colleagues from Just Jobs Network who have worked very hard to uh, help make this session possible. So thank you very much uh, for you know, what I think has been a really valuable, candid, um, nuanced and, and deep discussion on a, a very important emerging um, transformation in our times, which is the, the evolution of the uh, ecosystem of digital work and the gig economy and how we can make this a better place for workers and a better place for women and a, a more equitable uh, site for um, income generation and livelihoods.